in the second half of this two lecture series on transcription. We are going to focus on transcriptional regulation. Last class was entirely concentrated on the steps of synthesizing RNA from DNA. Now we're going to talk about how that process is initiated originally. Question in the back. Okay. Cipro is an inhibitor of bacterial DNA gyrase. Not all DNA gyrase is. It's not a chemotherapeutic. Um, there are examples of chemotherapeutics that, that work by, by those mechanisms of action. Um, but the antimicrobials are try to have that specificity that was laid out in the slide um, in, when we're introducing antibiotics and antimicrobials. To begin, I want to uh, make the distinction between the process of transcription itself, making the RNA by RNA polymerase once it's on the locus that is going to be transcribed, and the regulation of transcription, which you'll often hear uh, uh, said synonymously as gene expression. So the, the gene expression increases in gene expression, gene decreases in gene expression, talking about the transcriptional control of a locus, determining when that gene is transcribed and when it's not. It's here that those clinical disease wrappers will come into play. So mature onset diabetes of the young arises from a, uh, a family of defects related to gene regulation, gene expression of the insulin gene, not the transcription process generally, like I talked about last time. And then anabolic steroids, these circulating hormones that promote anabolism growth, more to say on that in, in a moment, uh, are also uh, gene regulators through the transcription factors that they operate on. Many in the audience know that the adverse effects of anabolic steroids, bodybuilders or otherwise, one year, I'm going to delete this slide because we don't have time to talk about every single one of these clinical phenotypes. Uh, but instead, what I want to uh, begin with is emphasizing that the reason why these are used for per performance enhancement or used therapeutically for age-related uh, declines and in, 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 um, function or age-related uh, diseases is because they are bioactive. They do elicit biological responses, and this is because of their mechanisms of action. And what these can do, anabolic steroids increase growth, muscle mass associated with strength, decrease in recovery time after injury, and also some of the behavioral effects. All of these are residing downstream of the steroid acting upon biomolecules in the cell and changing gene expression in different target cell types. But before we get there, um, we're going to begin, like we did in the general process of transcription, with examples from prokaryotes, because the gene regulation in prokaryotes is somewhat simpler, and then we'll transition over to the common themes that reemerge in eukaryotic transcription, but with added complexity. A classic example of gene regulation in bacteria is the handling of a sugar called lactose, milk sugars, uh, in bacteria. For the bacteria to be able to break down lactose and use it as a nutrient source to generate energy, it must be able to transport that lactose from outside the cell inside the cell. To enable that transport, lactose chemical structure is shown here, large-ish, hydrophilic, is not going to just diffuse passively across the membrane, it needs a dedicated transporter, and that dedicated transporter is called galactoside permease. It's a pump that will take lactose from outside the cell and push it into the, into the cell. So gene regulation of the permease is one thing that we'll talk about. And then hand in hand with the, the pump that brings lactose into the cell, there is another enzyme, the first enzyme 
that takes intracellular lactose and breaks it down, the, this disaccharide, so sugar one, sugar two, cuts it in the middle here, hydrolyzes it, and then releases a monosac two monosaccharides, glucose and galactose. That cleavage, hydrolysis, is catalyzed by an enzyme called beta-galactosidase. Thus, to get lactose, the bacteria to get lactose into, its, into the cell and be able to break it down so it can feed into these core metabolic pathways that you're going to hear about in quarter four, we need the galactoside permease and beta-galactosidase. These two genes and their regulation is what we're going to talk about in the next little bit. Now, to express galactoside permease and to express beta-galactosidase, this is energetically costly. We need to make the RNA. We'll need to make the protein. It's got to get traffic to the right places in the cell. And so it's only worth it for the organism evolutionarily to express those transporters and enzymes when lactose is present in the environment and when it would be metabolically beneficial to mobilize all of this machinery. And so these are the evolutionary origins of the gene expression circuit, the gene regulatory uh, circuit that I'll talk about now. The coordination of the enzyme and the permease, along with another enzyme that does a uh, non-essential modification to um, these beta-galactosides of, of the breakdown product, are all genes in the prokaryotic genome, but they are uh, set out tandem with one another, so back to back, into one gene expression unit. We touched on transcription units uh, when we were introducing transcription generally. This is an example, example of a prokaryotic transcriptional unit. And when that transcriptional unit is a set of genes, all with a related function, it's called an operon. To orient you. Here is a cartoon of the operon for lactose handling called the LAC operon. We have a promoter here. We talk about core promoters right in the beginning of the, uh, where transcription occurs. More to say on this operator in a moment. But downstream of the transcription start site, you'll see the genes, the loci that encode when transcribed, beta-galactosidase, the permease, and then this additional uh, lactose handling enzyme. Three different proteins, but all transcribed as one RNA. And that nature of tandem back-to-back -back, uh, RNAs in a single gene uh, transcription unit is called a polycystron or polycystronic mRNA. And what that simply means is that there are, will be multiple translation events coming off that single mRNA that is transcribed. Both operons and polycystrons, you'll see in prokaryotes. You can see in viruses, but you don't see in eukaryotes. But it does simplify the upstream gene regulation by having these all uh, in tandem. So, so the regulation of operons in prokaryotes breaks down to the business end of the operon, the so-called structural genes, these are the gene products that execute the function um, that is motivating the regulation of the operon to begin with, like that beta-galactosidase, the permease. Those are uh, effectors of the, the operon. They achieve the, the, the function of the operon. Layered on top of those structural genes, there are also what are called regulatory genes that could be in the operon itself. And in fact, uh, for people that have interests in synthetic biology, encoding regulatory genes within operons that encode other structural genes, that's an uh, engineering strategy to give that operon interesting dynamical systems properties or steady state uh, properties. But it's also possible for these regulatory genes to impinge upon the regulation of the operon, but be outside of the operon itself. And in fact, all of the examples that we'll discuss today fall into that category. We have the regulatory gene not in the operon, but uh, 
contributing to the way in which the operon and its transcription is controlled. And it, it there's this, the, the, where does this name of the operon? There's a little bit of um, uh, iterative logic when some of these terms, because the operon comes on is because of this notion of a gene, uh, gene sequence in the operon called an operator. And the operator is a sequence. It'll be defined by a consensus sequence up in the beginning of the RNA transcript in the vicinity of the promoter. Okay. But downstream of the promoter itself, that controls the ability of RNA polymerase to transcribe that locus. And it's here that uh, where those the, the gene products of the regulatory genes will impinge upon the operon. So as an example here, we saw the cartoon of the LAC operon, the genes themselves promoter and operator. The additional regulatory gene, this gene here called the LAC-I, has its own promoter, its own uh, gene regulation. But what it encodes is an RNA whose protein product acts as a regulator of the LAC operon. And that gene product is called the LAC repressor, LAC-I or the LAC repressor. When the LAC I gene is transcribed and then translated, it makes a protein product that will bind to the operator sequence. When the LAC repressor is bound to the operator, the operon cannot be transcribed by RNA polymerase. You can think about it as a physical barrier, steric barrier. It's occluding the gene sequence, parts of the promoter that are essential for uh, RNA polymerase to start transcription. All of that can't happen if the LAC repressor is bound to the operator. Now where the LAC repressor interfaces with lactose itself is that its ability to act as a repressor depends on the presence or absence of lactose in the environment. And in the environment means in the environment of inside the cell. So when the lac repressor is free of lactose, unbound from lactose, it serves its operator, uh, it serves its repressor function, okay? bound to the locus, no genes transcript. However, if a small amount of lactose gets into the cells, it will bind to the lac repressor, conformational change, allosteric change of the repressor. And then what occurs is that the repressor will fall off of the operator and then free the lac operon to be transcribed by RNA polymerase. So this is an example of a general category of gene regulatory mechanisms called substrate induction. When lactose is present, you have a derepression of the operon. And ordinarily, it's repressed by the lac repressor, but you have lactose now around, comes off, the operator derepresses the operon. Now RNA polymerase binds to that core promoter and will transcribe the uh, breakdown enzyme more of the uh, transporter to be able to bring more of it in, into the cells and the other modifying enzyme. Questions on the operon operator model? All right, not too bad. There are other configurations, and one of which we'll talk about now. The the LAC operon, as I introduced, is uh, geared towards breaking down lactose as um, a metabolite. Breaking down is catabolism. It's a catabolic pathway 
to take a complex biomolecule, break it up into smaller subunits that can be handled for sources of energy inside the cell. We talked about anabolic steroids. There are also anabolic pathways that do the opposite, take simple building blocks inside our cells, join them together through chemistry, and build more complicated building blocks for the cell to use, putting energy into the system to build those more complicated uh, biomolecules. And the one uh, example, operon-mediated regulation, is in the synthesis of the amino acid tryptophan. We did amino acids all the way back in quarter one. Tryptophan, big aromatic, hydrophobic amino acid. There's a dedicated enzymatic pathway in bacteria to be able to synthesize that amino acid when needed. And the dedicated pathway in prokaryotes is, called, is another operon. It's called the TRIP operon. Let's look at the operon itself first. It's a series of five enzymes that encode um, different subunits of the tryptophan synthetase that's needed to be able to uh, build. Tryptophan is an amino acid from precursors. So you need all of these working together to be able to synthesize tryptophan. This is another advantage of the operon model in that when one RNA is transcribed, you have one and exactly one copy of each gene, each uh, gene within the polycystron. So a stoichiometry of particular enzyme complexes or pathways is really important. The operon model works great because every single time you transcribe three, you get one of each. There's the trip operon. It's called an operon because of the contiguous arrangement of the genes as well as the operator sequence. It, uh, what else we have? We talked about the promoter. There's a leader sequence in here, which I'm not emphasizing. It simply provides some degree of graded regulation of the trip op operon in response to um, this, the repressor that I'm going to talk about uh, in, this, in this moment. Um, and the repressor protein that impacts on the operator sequence of, of trip is called the trip repressor. However, the trip repressor is regulated differently than the lac repressor. Trip, the trip repressor in the absence of tryptophan, so when tryptophan is needed, is in a conformation that renders it unable to act as a repressor to the trip operon. So ordinarily, if there's no tryptophan around or there is a need for the cell to synthesize tryptophan, that trip repressor is off the operator sequence. But once the cell uh, has an elevated concentration of tryptophan intracellularly, that elevated concentration of tryptophan intracellularly will bind to the trip repressor. Trip repressor undergoes a conformational change, and now in that conformation changed structure of the trip repressor, it can bind to the operator sequence and turn off the operon. In other words, once the trip operon has gene products of the trip operon have made enough tryptophan in the cell, the end product feeds back onto the regulation of the gene circuit through binding to the trip repressor and shuts it off. This gives rise to the name of end product repression, another form of gene regulation common in bacteria. So the end result of a gene regulatory event feeds back onto the regulation of the genes that give rise to it to be able to shut it off. Because these are also energetically costly, just like I talked about for uh, the LAC operon. Let's combine these two together. So for LAC, we have this the substrate lactose acting as these small molecule, the regulator that gives rise to the effect of the gene regulatory circuit. Right? So that's why it's called an effector. It gives rise to the effect. The effect is to metabolize, to catabolize um, lactose. And it does it by derepression. Conversely, with TRIP, it's not the input of the metabolic pathway. It's the output 
of the metabolic pathway, the product that then feeds back to, rep to repress the genes that gave rise to that product. And think about this as a, I talk about as a derepression, a disinhibition type of regu regulation. Here, you have, a, if you will, a gain of function of the repressor that is achieved by the, the product that's made of the, uh, the enzymes encoded by the operon. Both of these involve repressors, trip R, lack I. Doesn't have to be that way. All right, so it's not just negative regulation for transcription. There are also transcription factors or transactivating factors that can impinge upon these operons and positively regulate the operon. And there's a nice example of that in, with LAC. Here's the, the beta-galactosidase gene. I already talked about the operator and the promoter, so LAC I. The lac repressor uh, gene product will bind here. There's another site upstream of the promoter that is a site for positive regulation. And it's here where another metabolic input feeds in and informs the gene circuit about whether the pathway should be activated. And that other um, metabolite is glucose. We haven't done anything with metabolism yet, but glucose is a very important monosaccharide that feeds into a core catabolic pathway for ATP generation in cells. So we need glucose. Think back to insulin, blood sugar control, it's all on blood glucose, circulating blood glucose is that first um, input into this metabolic pathway. And the, path, uh, the enzymes that regulate the breakdown of glucose are always on, because this is a core pathway. We need, we need glucose. Okay, so those don't have a, um, this type of operon regulation. They're chronically expressed or constitutively expressed, which means always basal transcription factors, always RNA polymerase. There are high levels of these enzymes all the time. Since there are high levels of these enzymes all the time, if glucose is around, why mess around with lactose? If there's enough glucose, just metabolize that. And so this is where this additional site and an additional transcription factor comes into to, to play here. What you'd like to do, or what the cell would like to do, is only engage the lactose, the, the lac operon and lactose metabolism if lactose is around and glucose is not. So you need this coincidence detector, if you will, of low glucose and high lactose together turning on the lac operon. And this is achieved through this transcription factor called catabolite regulation protein, or CRP for short. And CRP uh, is a protein. It is, acts as a transcription factor that helps recruit RNA polymerase to the locus to enable it to transcription to occur. And it has an interesting relationship with a second messenger that you heard about quarter two, quarter one, I don't remember, cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP um, and the metabolite glucose. So if glucose is high inside the cell, cyclic AMP is low. And the concentration of cyclic AMP matters uh, to CRP because when the levels of cyclic AMP are high, those high levels of second messenger will bind to CRP. And the complex between CRP and cyclic AMP is required for it to act as a transcription factor, get recruited to the CRP site upstream of the LAC operon, and then promote transcription of the locus. So to walk through the pathway here, the, the way in which this will evaluate this, the concentration of glucose is that if glucose is low, which is when you'd want to turn it on, cyclic AMP levels rise, as cyclic AMP levels rise, they bind to CRP, and the cyclic AMP bound CRP will bind to the CRP site on the LAC operon and then help promote transcription, provided that the LAC repressor is not smack in the middle there preventing transcription. So I'll leave this slide 
for Piazza discussions or if you want to chat with your colleagues uh, after class about the different scenarios. If you have one of the metabolites or you don't have the others, you have them both together, what would be the outcomes of the LAC operon? We have a couple more terms that we need to discuss as we segue into eukaryotic gene regulation. Um, and this is uh, the cis and transacting uh, elements and factors. Things like an operator, things like a core promoter, an initiator, a CRP site, these are all DNA sequences close to where the promoter and the transcriptional initiation occurs. And they're on the DNA sequence where transcription occurs right next to it. So that right next to nature of those DNA sequences um, gives rise to this name called cis-acting elements. Elements are DNA elements, DNA sequences that confer properties to the gene locus. And they do it in cis because they are in the sequence is it contained on and nearby the gene where the regulation occurs. By contrast, think about the regulatory genes, LAC repressor, TRIP repressor. They have their own promoter. They could be very, very far away if it were a, uh, a eukaryotic have chromosomes, it could be a totally separate chromosome. The gene is regulated over there. It's the protein product that goes and regulates this other locus. And so those genetic sequences that impinge upon a, a, on a locus but are encoded elsewhere in the genome, those are called transacting elements. And the protein products themselves are called transacting factors. to reiterate this because the students get turned around each year on this. The gene sequence of the LAC, of LAC I, the LAC I gene, would be an example of a transacting element for the LAC operon. But the protein product, the LAC I protein or LAC repressor, that's a transacting factor that goes on act, and acts upon the LAC operon. The operator sequence would be a cis-acting element. Ah, so why, why might these, why might the regulator be very far away from the elements upon which it's acting upon? Um, I would think not so much that there's an advantage to having it happen. I think that there's no disadvantage for it not happening. And, and so it's one of those examples that they're closer, they're nearby. Once the gene product is transcribed and translated, it's diffusing around in the cell. And that's where really the mechanism of action is. We use these terminologies, though, simply to keep track of what are the things that are happening in cis when we talk about transcriptional regulation versus other tr transacting factors elsewhere that are coming into the locus and uh, affecting its regulation. We can take this no notion of cis-acting elements, trans-acting factors, and move now over to eukaryotes. As I said in the beginning, the, ba the same basic principles hold. There are promoters, RNA polymerase recruitment, other accessory factors that are promoting or inhibiting transcription uh, itself. These transacting proteins are largely called are largely transcription factors, broadly called transcription factors in eukaryotes. And they are acting upon these cis elements, consensus sequences that are recognized by DNA binding domains in those transcription factors. So those things are the same. What's different and where the complexity increases for eukaryotes is that the notion of what's close 
in eukaryotic gene regulation is much more lenient. So close could be thousands of bases, tens of thousands of bases away from the gene that's actually getting regulated. And there's a lot more combinatorial complexity of the transcription factors that together converge on the regulation of a single gene. So there are many more transcription factors coming in on a locus and whether or not it's transcribed. And the regions in the genome that are informing that gene regulatory event are much further separated away from the actual transcription start site. Let's do a cartoon example of the eukaryotic gene regulation. Let's say in response to two stimuli. So stimulus A induces a transacting element, transacting factor. So you have a transcription factor A. And now there are two genes that have consensus sequences in their promoters that are recognized and bound by transcription factor A, both of them. But in response to stimulus B, there's another transacting element that gets transcribed, making another transcription factor. But only one of these two gene sequences has a DNA uh, uh, consensus sequence that's recognized by transcription factor B. Now you have two transcription factors bound, recruiting, trying to assemble the pre-initiation complex on the gene on the left compared to one on the right. The gene on the left is going to be more efficient at recruiting RNA pol 2 to give rise to RNA. There will still be recruitment of RNA polymerase to the other gene, but not as much. Lower gene induction. And this holds for multiple transcription factors, separate, one, uh, separate ones, or multiple copies of the same transcription factor being recruited to um, multiple events of a consensus a DNA binding sequence in a promoter or in a, uh, more distant regions for eukaryotes. So more binding of these transcription factors generally gives rise to more gene products. It's not a linear relationship, but it is in generally thought to be increasing. I want to speak a little bit more about these uh, cis control elements and the more flexible definition of cis in eukaryotic gene regulation. Cis can be anywhere on that DNA strand. And we have very long chromosomes. And in the nucleus, those long linear chromosomes can wrap up on top of themselves, so much so that it's hard to know what's close in the nucleus compared to what you think might be close based upon looking at the linear DNA sequence. This is part of that, that complexity. But we can separate sequences that are close, at least in linear sequence space, to the core promoter in a transcription start site. Those are called proximal control elements. Proximal, close, D cis DNA elements close to that core promoter. No car cartoon of that here, but let's say that they'd be in this vicinity close by. If they're close in linear space, they're going to be close in three-dimensional topological space in the nucleus. So those often will, will gravitate our attention uh, towards those because we know they're going to be close, close by. I have a note to remind me that those control elements don't have to be always upstream of the transcription start site. There are examples of ones that are in the early portion of the gene. It's all about recruitment. If you have these binding events and those binding events give more opportunity for basal transcription factors, TF2D, and the pre-initiation complex to assemble. All of those things have the potential to promote RNA polymerase to uh, recruitment. The same holds for the more distal control elements. To be honest, this threshold of 100 base pairs is not magical. That's just a rough ballpark. I think people would even consider a couple of 100 base pairs out and around the transcription start sites still to be pretty proximal control elements. The more distal ones can be thousands to tens of thousands of bases away. How do they still act upon the locus? It's the thinking, and there's experimental evidence to support this, 
is that you get folding of the genome in 3D space that actually puts some of those cis-acting elements in close 3D proximity to the transcription start site. And what binds there are uh, families of transcriptional regulatory uh, proteins called either enhancers, if they promote the assembly of the pre-initiation complex, TF2D, et cetera, or repressors if they block all that stuff from happening. And so the definition of an enhancer or a repressor is a function of the other types of co-activators or co-repressors that are brought into the vicinity of the, um, the locus that's going to be transcribed, boiling down to the assembly of TF2D pre-initiation complex in the recruitment of RNA pol 2 Let me give you an example of how complicated this can be. It's a paper from my group. A couple of genes that we were interested in on the left-hand side. The arrows indicate DNA consensus sequences for two transcription factors that we were interested in in studying and figuring out how they might impinge upon the genes that are on the, on the slide here. There are green and yellow arrowheads all over these genes. This arrow here, that's the transcription start site. Some of them are close by. Some of them are further away. Ignore the purple part. That's just how we measure them uh, experimentally. Many tandem copies. Some of them are close enough that they may cooperate with one another. Some of them are close enough that they may antagonize one another. And it still remains for anyone to be able to look at these promoter and enhancer architectures and infer which are the critical elements for regulation of the gene. We can figure them out by experiment, but we can't look at the DNA sequence or infer the 3D structure and figure out where, um, which ones are really critical, except by trial and error or omic type of approaches. I don't have a more satisfying end to you than that, but that's one of these open questions in biology, the gene, gene regulation. All right, time to circle back to mature onset diabetes of the young from the setting of transcriptional regulation. Modi is a, uh, it's an inherited disorder. There's a mutation, there's a defect in certain genes that are crucial for the regulation of insulin RNA transcription. We're going to focus on one category here of defects related to a transcription factor called HNFs. To connect MODI with HNF, we need to introduce two acronyms. First, what the heck is HNF? It stands for hepatic nuclear factor. And DCOH which has a big long name of a dimer dimerization cofactor of homeodomains. Let's say what these things are. HNF is the transcription factor. It is going to recruit those coactivators, enable the assembly of pre-initiation complex recruitment of PALT2. HNF, however, only can bind DNA as a dimer. I haven't shown you too many crystal structures. I'll, sh I'll show you one ribbon diagram of this. But oftentimes, you'll have transcription factors assemble as dimers or tetramers, and they wrap around the DNA helix, and that's how they achieve their uh, sequence recognition. So HNF needs to be as a dimer. DCOH, kind of like an adapter, uh, it brings together different uh, transcription factors or protein-protein in interactions uh, to enable them to do the recruitment and the assembly that I just described. It doesn't have any <clears throat> DNA recognition ability in and of itself. That's conferred by, conferred by HNF. And so you have this mutual need for the complex between HNF and DC, DCOH to be able to assemble a proper uh, transcriptional regulatory assembly that can promote transcription. And here's the way in cartoon form that this should ordinarily uh, work. DCOH assembles with itself. 
and can, in fact, assemble with itself in a homotetrameric form, like in the cartoon. But two of those copies of uh, DCOH can be displaced by hepatic nuclear factor. And it's this heterotetramer of two DCOHs and two HNFs that is the mature um, complex that acts as a transcriptional enhancer at the insulin gene locus. So HNFs will provide the DNA binding ability. <coughs> Recruitment of coactivators, but those are only possible if they're brought together as a dimer through DCOH. When this binds to the uh, enhancer elements on the insulin gene, pre-initiation complex, and then RNA polymerase transcribing the RNA. Capped, polyadenylated, spliced, mature insulin mRNA, transcription and translation of the insulin protein. Where the defects, the inherited defects in HNF occur, they are enriched at the binding interface with the DCOH. You see the number, lots of them. These two alpha helices coming together, the interaction interface that allows those HNFs to, uh, to dimerize in the way that I described. If there are inherited mutations in the, the HNFs that disrupt that binding interface with DCOH, now you don't have the heterotetramer. Now you can't recognize the enhancer element on the insulin locus, and now those individuals can't properly regulate the transcription of the insulin gene. Ah, and there are also some examples of reciprocal mutations in other MODI individuals that have DCOH, mu DCOH mutations, presumably around here. Okay. A couple brief words on uh, treatment for MODI patients specifically. One of them is insulin. Even though these, these individuals have officially a type two form of diabetes and that it's later uh, onset, they're not resistant to the mechanisms of insulin. They just can't synthesize it, can't transcribe it properly. There are also other uh, clever ways in which you take things orally to re reduce your blood sugar. One of, this one's kind of neat, these sulfonyl uh, ureas, they uh, promote release of whatever insulin is inside those uh, beta cells, they kind of force it out of the cell. So even if they're a bit anemic in making it, they'll be able to drive whatever insulin is to, to uh, get released indirectly through protein trafficking, more of those things that we'll talk about in the, in the coming weeks. And then these more elaborate interventions, transplanting whole organs, transplanting new islets from donors that don't have, for example, HNF, uh, mutations. They are under investigation, but they're highly investigational, and so they're not routine. It's a cost-benefit analysis from undergoing an invasive surgery, cell engineering, transplantation versus simply dosing these individuals with insulins or, or oral hypoglycemics. Questions on MODI, HNFs, DCOH? Insulin regulation. Yeah, let, I'll rephrase your, your question. Um, it's like a chicken and the egg sort of thing. Is it that the DCOH enables the HNFs to dimerize or vice versa, they're brought together? It's the D DCOH has the propensity to self assemble into heterotetramers. So it has a natural self-binding ability. Um, and then the HNFs can bind to DCOH, and by virtue of binding to DCOH, and then by virtue of the self-binding ability of DCOH, now you bring them together as the hetero complex, the heterotetrameric complex. All right, let's move on. Talk about steroids in the last 15 minutes. Also, gene regulation, very different, though, than everything that I've talked about up to this point. Steroids, generally, as a class, are brought together by this chemical structure that is blue here. 
so called the steroid nucleus. So this hydrocarbon ring here, six member, six member, six member, five, five member, that's the fundamental scaffold from which all steroids are synthesized. Examples that you'll see here. We're going to talk about testosterone or synthetic derivatives, but this is also where other steroid hormones such as estrogen, progesterone, corticosteroids, they all have that steroid nucleus. And they all stem off of cholesterol remember from membranes, okay, shown here on the right. Steroids are circulating hormones. We talked about hormones in an earlier quarter. But unlike peptide hormones, these are hydrophobic because of the steroid nucleus. And so what that means is that they can go right through the plasma membrane. They don't need dedicated transporters or uh, pores, channels, pumps, none of that. They just diffuse right through. See, where the challenge is is how they move around in the bloodstream. It's an aqueous environment. And so where the help transporting uh, steroid hormones comes from is from a very abundant protein in our blood. It's called albumin. Albumin is important for maintaining osmotic gradients in our bloodstream. It's important for um, sticking to foreign particles that we might think to get into our bloodstream, bacteria, other things, and get this process called opsonization. But it's also key as a carrier for um, hydrophobic molecules that we synthesize or use as, re as regulatory hormones, such as steroids. I said they don't have uh, channels or pumps or anything at the membrane, but they do have receptors. They're not like G-protein coupled receptors or other things, seven pass, none of that. They have, their receptors are inside the cell. And here's a general example of the way in which they work. Their signaling is pretty straightforward. There's, the details vary a little bit, and you can always layer on additional complexities on top, but they're all pretty much in, in this type of uh, category. If there's a steroid hormone in the environment of a cell, it diffuses freely through the plasma membrane. And then it encounters its intracellular receptor somewhere inside the cell. Could be in the nucleus, could be in the cytoplasm. That steroid receptor, two things can, can happen. This is an example for a glucocorticoid receptor. You can have some of those intracellular receptors be in an inhibited form. This is what the cartoon shows here. So it's in a complex with an inhibitor. And then upon binding the steroid hormone after it's diffused into the cell, that complex is separated. The steroid hormone receptor is disinhibited. And these will usually assemble. They often will dimerize. An example shown here. That forms a transcription factor, okay. binds to a steroid response element, a DNA element cis-acting element in the, the um, genome. And then that will recruit reinitiation complex, RNA polymerase, and everything from, from there. Variants on this theme. They don't all have to have inhibitors. Some can simply be in an inactive state. And then by virtue of binding their cognate steroid hormone, undergo a conformational change to enable them to become active. But there's some degree of inhibition, either structural, allosteric, involving the steroid hormone receptor itself, or um, an associated protein. And then they become activated when the steroid binds. And so anabolic steroids. Here's an example of one. Chemical name, clinical name, Completeness chemical structure uh, shown here. This anabolic steroid uh, binds to the androgen receptor. It is an analog of androgen or testosterone. So I'm answering the questions here because keeping them up with the time. Looks kind of like testosterone. But there are certain function, uh, chemical changes off of this, uh, the steroid nucleus that cause it to bind more tightly. 
So the androgen receptor, which would ordinarily sense it because of some of the functional group changes out on the sides there, higher affinity. And in addition, by uh, the higher affinity interaction prevents some of the negative feedback mechanisms that would ordinarily shut off androgen receptor signaling. An example of end product repression, some of the gene regulatory events that occur after the transcription factor has been activated, modify the transcription factor itself to enable it uh, to shut it off, have it be less active as a transcription factor. And those are disrupted with these synthetic anabolic steroids. So it's kind of on, 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 on all the time. So what, what happened? Okay. So you have chronic androgen receptor signaling inside the cell. I'm pretty sure this image is fake, but I didn't find it. So I'm, yeah. All right. One key target of androgen receptor signaling, it's not insulin itself, but another related peptide growth factor called insulin-like growth factor, or IGF-1, because there are multiple IGFs. And IGF confers some, a lot, of the bioactivity of, an of anabolic steroids and the way that people use them. It's a peptide hormone. It has a transmembrane receptor. It's hydrophilic, okay, so it needs a transmembrane receptor. Turns on signaling, classes of signaling that we hear about before the end of the semester. And those signaling events that occur inside the cell promote cell growth, cell biosynthesis, protein biosynthesis, translation, more, more, more. They also inhibit breakdown pathways also hear about so these more catabolic pathways, things that would cause the cells to go, go smaller, growth to slow. Those are inhibited, and then the pro-growth pathways are revved up. And as you might imagine, you can also use IGF as a therapeutic for um, you know, growth failures, fit for people that are not keeping up with their kids that have uh, growth issues and things can be supplemented um, with, with IGF to stay on their uh, on their curves, and it's also something that sports agencies look out for as a performance enhancing agent. So in many ways, you can think of IGF and IGF receptor signaling as one of the effectors of androgen receptor signaling from the perspective of muscle growth or any of the other things that we described. And fun fact, if you're a dog lover, it's a key regulator of animal size. What is that thing, a Great Dane? Right? Yeah. High levels of circulating IGF-1, and then the Chihuahua in the lower left, low levels of circulating IGF-1. It's like a big, big dog geneticist was able to link these out. So, If you think some of these facets of transcriptional regulation are interested, I turn once again to our Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics. Multiple individuals, David, Marty, and another David, interested in different really crucial categories of transcription factors or some of these polymerase recruitment events that, that I described. Questions about steroids, IGFs, dogs. Okay, I'll see you on Thursday.